For the past 12 years, I have brought you conversations with great photographers. From legends to lesser known photographers, it's always been my goal to introduce you to people who not only produce great work, but who are also inspirations. Over the past few months, as I've met many of you, you have shared how much the show has meant to you. I'm not only flattered by that, but it has encouraged me to produce more conversations for many years to come. Your financial support has also been invaluable. It has allowed us to create the free Candid Frame app and the new Alexa skill. It has also helped us to invest in microphones, recording devices, and software that's helped us to improve the sound quality of the show and improve the website. It's also helped us to travel to meet photographers in person to conduct interviews face-to-face, which provides a wonderful dynamic to our conversations. If you love what we're doing here and it's making a difference in your photographic life, I encourage you to donate today. You can support the work we do here by contributing as little as $2 a month to our Patreon campaign. That modest donation helps us to bring a quality show to you every week. Contribute today by visiting patreon.com forward slash the candid frame. This is Ibarri and X, and this is The Candid Frame. This year has been a really good one for me photographically. I have worked hard at developing and refining my eye. It's not been just about making a lot of photographs, but more about being thoughtful and purposeful about how I use light and shadow, line and shape, color and gesture. That's been helped by my teaching, but also writing my next book, which is a follow-up to my first, Chasing the Light. I've been focused on my own process to a degree that it's moved me beyond my own perceived limits to make photographs I might not have taken years or, or even months ago. That's why a YouTube video featuring today's guest, Nicholas Pinto, resonated so much with me. Recorded for the Leica Society, LHSA, he spoke about the very things that have become so important to me over the last six months, which have improved my photography. Focusing on how I see and how I wield a camera has made a tremendous difference in my creativity this year. And I hope that this conversation inspires you to do the same. Well, welcome to the show, Th- first off. Thank you. Um, really pleased to have you. And one of the things that really sort of piqued my interest when I watched this video that, uh, uh, what is it, is the Leica, what is the the group that you teach at again? It's well, the Leica. Um, I teach with Leica Academy and I also, um, mm. the Leica Historical Society is like. Leica Historical right, Society. Exactly. Right, exactly. Yeah. That's where I saw the video. Mm. And one of the things you talked about was this whole idea of discomfort. Right. And I thought, wow, that's really that's a place I often try to put myself as a photographer is that level of discomfort. Right. And I have found it to be invaluable. Mm-hmm. But in this culture, we're sort of taught to avoid discomfort at all costs. Yeah, yeah. And but I, it sounds like for you, it's an invaluable part of your creative process. So let's, so let's start there. What are you talking about in terms of embracing, embracing discomfort? Well, I think embracing discomfort is something that uh, you I've applied to photography, but also I think in life in general. I think there came a point as a photographer where I started to realize that there wasn't like a version of me that was a photographer, a version of me that was a family man, a version of me that it was kind of all melded together. And mm-hmm. basically, once I started making life choices that also kind of embraced being uncomfortable that's when the photography you know got a little more energy and became a little more powerful um because you know it wasn't something that i was uh was just saying it was something that i was like starting to live and by doing that i think you know it kind of translated to whatever situation i was in or whatever i was doing you know just appreciating the the things around me or understanding like what it took for me to get to that place and not trying to you know waste opportunities or or things like that. So being uncomfortable is not something that, you know, I'm not saying you don't want to have comforts. You don't want to have, you don't want to enjoy things. It's quite the opposite. It means 
you know, that shouldn't be your end all goal. Like your goal shouldn't be, I want to be as comfortable as possible, or I want to, I want to be as safe as possible, or I want to, I want to take the the path that's, you know, that that's nerfed in a way, you know, like I, I actually want to, you know, get out there and, and introduce myself to the world and, and take chances. And obviously, you know, logically and mindfully, you don't just, you know, put yourself out there without calculation, but at the same time, there's a level that you can go to that you probably don't know you can get there. And that's kind of what I love about photography. It kind of pushes you every time you get to that place, you go a little further Mm -hmm. and then you realize there's more. And, 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 and through each step, you're, you're, you're constantly embracing that, that feeling of being, you know, out of your comfort zone. What advantage does that give you being willing to go that discomfort that another photographer doesn't have? You know, we can look at it as an advantage. Um, at, at the end of the day, you're you're taking pictures for a reason. Um, you have a camera. You you've done all this work to get your gear and to to you know make sure you you're you're ready to go. And you know, a lot of the times, you know, photographers I, I've heard anyways uh, in discussion like, well, you know, I do this for me or things like that. But at the end of the day, you're really you know you're doing it for yourself. But you're the act of taking a picture is trying to share it and trying to, you know, to, to not do it just for yourself. Um, so I think the, the thing that you want to stick to is, you know, trying to merge that together, you know, like how do you keep it for yourself and share it with others? And then in that process, you know, you, you get to the place where you're like, okay, now I know it. I, I figured it out. I, this is what I want to do. This is how I want to approach it. And in that way, photography is kind of like, again, it's, 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 it's constantly teaching, you know, it's constantly pushing you and teaching you. And, and, and part of it is being uncomfortable. Part of that teaching is, you know, how do you get to those places of being, you know, a little less comfortable than normal and be, and be comfortable there. Sorry about that. Yeah. Can you point to a, a particular project or series of photographs where you feel like your willingness to embrace that discomfort really resulted in images that you might not otherwise have made? Yeah, I think, again, I think it goes back to um, like the the point of life in general as well. Like, so I was somebody that when I got out of uh, high school, I went into the military. And when I got out, you know, I, I picked up photography. I went to school for photography. And it was just something that I immediately connected to. And so one of the things that I feel like started me taking photography seriously was after all that, after, you know, everything. And after I was working, like, let's say different positions, different jobs within the corporate world where I wasn't necessarily happy or feeling content with my life, you know, knowing that I had this camera, that I had uh, something I wanted to say, things that I wanted to do. And it was kind of like kept inside. So there came a point where I actually went to New York and I took a Magnum uh, workshop. During that time that I was in New York, I was able to sit down with um, uh, a magnum photographer named Nikos Ikonomopoulos. Oh, yeah. Who's one yeah. of my favorite photographers. And he basically, you know, I, I, I have, I had a child. I had one child at the time. I have two now. Um, and I'm married. So, you know, I basically wanted to get his advice on, you know, first of all, is this something that you, you think I can do? And second of all, how do I start the process to, to be in a place where I want to be? And he was very honest. If you've ever been critiqued by photographers at that level, I'm sure you have, they don't hold back, you know, they, they're very honest. And that's what I wanted. And because I let him know, like, I don't want to waste time. Like, you know, if this is not for me, then I'm willing to go to something else and do something else. And so he, I mean, he based his advice to me was to be a photographer. You have to be a photographer every day. You have to wake up, as a photographer, go to sleep as a photographer and start to think as a photographer. He's like, I'm not saying to go home and quit your job. I'm not saying to do that. But at the end of the day, like this is what it takes. And then he explained to me how, you know, he had gone through that process with him and his own family and how, how mm-hmm. that was difficult. But, you know, at the end of the day, that's what he was going for. So that decision or those conversations are very uncomfortable to have because, you know, now you're now you're life changing. Now you're thinking about what's the next step. And then when I, you know, came back to Chicago, I was pretty clear on what I needed to do. Um, now I took the steps I needed to take, but I, you know, I, I took those steps. And, and so ever since then, you know, any project I've shot, anything I've done, you know, has always kind of pushed me into those places where, 
you know, I, I basically start as a street photographer and then find my way into it, it could be, you know, I, I did a project on uh, silos in Chicago here where there was a group of um, squatters, you would call them living in, mm-hmm. in silos. And it just started from a street photography project. But the thing is there when you dive into projects like that, you learn and then you knocking on the door, not knowing who's behind the door, things like that. You know, these are these are things that, you know, you have to be willing to do to try to, you know, see what's next, see what's, again, behind that door. And sometimes, yeah. sometimes it's what you're looking to explore. Sometimes it's, it's really interesting. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's like, okay, well, I don't, I'm not really interested in this or it's not, you know. So there, there's always yeah. that, <laughs> there's always that level of like, I don't know what's going to happen next. But I think as well, as long as you're willing to, to knock on those doors or to, to, to put yourself in situations where, again, not recklessly, not just walking around just, you know, without a, with a, without a purpose, but you're actually going into things and situations with uh, mindfulness where you're like, okay, I like this person for some reason. Like, mm-hmm. for some reason, this person has something that is interesting to me, a story, or there, there's just something about it. And, and, and you just know to stick with it. You know, it's like, I don't know, it's, you have this, and I think Every photographer has those moments, you know, where I should probably hang out with this person or and then you're like, oh, I got to go, actually, because whatever, you know, and I think we all make the decision sometimes to walk away. And then sometimes we make a decision to follow. And I guess the point to tie it all together back to the discussion I had with Nikos is that, you know, to follow is uncomfortable. It's to 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 take the dives, to jump off the yeah. the edge, you know, and those kind of things. And I think that's where that's the, the road that it's t- it takes you down. And so you got to kind of embrace that. Yeah, that was, that was really um, an interesting thing for me when I, when I heard you um, in another interview talk about it, this idea is that you're out in the street making your street photographs, you have this encounter with someone, and then that trigger happens. It's like, you know, you talk to them, and then you sort of realize that, well, there's something more that could happen here. Mm-hmm. And then what starts as a just a, a street photograph suddenly becomes almost like a documentary photojournalistic project in which you're exploring someone's one's life, which is kind of in line with what you were talking about in terms of making a career right? as, as a photographer. What, tell, tell me about that part of the, you know, that transition. Because when you're doing street photographs, you're usually thinking about the singular photograph. Mm-hmm. You're not really thinking about necessarily storytelling. Right. Especially within a series of images. Tell me about learning and understanding that because that is part and parcel of what was going to make you valuable in terms of a professional photographer. Right, right. Well, I think when you're shooting street photography, obviously you're looking for scenes, you're looking for interesting characters, you're looking for light, you're looking for all the things that are going to make a good photograph. The difference between uh, telling a story or like a a short story or a a long essay or whatever, it's a documentary series, is that you're doing the same process except you're focusing on whatever it is that you've you've been drawn to, you know? So it's kind of like taking the same aspect of street photography because we're all drawn to different things. That's why if you give, you know, five photographers, five cameras and send them out in the same street, they're going to come back with pretty different work. So we're all pretty much drawn to different things for different reasons. And that's kind of what interests me about photography too, like that aspect of it. But the the next step from taking that step of, okay, now I found this person and I'm with them in their house or why am I like, why, why am I drawn to them? That's the question that through that process, like it's more about you have to answer that for yourself. What is it that you're taking the time to spend now with this person or with this group or with the subject matter, like, why is this something that's important to you? And then, and through answering that, you know, you kind of, you know, figure out why you're there. But then as far as the process, it's the same, you know, when you take a street photograph, like you want to make a good picture, like you, you want all the elements of a good photograph in that, in that image. And so it's the same principle. I mean, you might not get all the layers every time. You might not get all the different aspects mm-hmm. of what sh- the street provides. Because if you think about the street, it's a really wide angle place. It, it's it's there, today's modern streets are really wide. There's a lot of information. There's a lot of there's a lot of things to capture. And when you're usually like in a more secluded space or something that's more where a documentary process would be happening, where you're indoors sometimes, or you're you know depending on the project 
you know, there's different elements that you have to add into the, into the, into the mix here. You can't just rely on the street. And so that's where you start to pick things that are maybe in the home or, you know, if, if it's like I did a project about, um, um, and it's still an ongoing project about um, people that suffer with some types of depression and mental illness is that, you know, I, I look for the details in their home, you know, the things that, you know, the little subtle things that might show me that they're what they're struggling with, because, you know, that's a subject that you can't really capture in an image. I mean, you can. And there's ways, obviously, there's the there's the unhappiness part of it and some of the other frustration that that tends to kind of come out of it. But there's all these other subtle things that, you know, just by sticking with someone or hanging out with them and being a part of their life, you start to notice things that, you know, they may find normal, but whatever normal is, is is maybe not considered that. And those are the elements you want to pull out. So the same way you would do in a street photograph where you're looking for color or you're looking for a certain shape or a certain kind of geometrical figure, you're doing that, but with information more, because I think documentary relies more. I mean, obviously everything is in, in, has that emotional aspect. That's what you want because you want mm-hmm. a person's going to be looking at it, but you also want um, in a documentary uh, project to, to pull as much information as you can in the image, you know, where, you know, the design, I think the design level of a street photograph is much more important. <laughs> so like, yeah. you know, if there's that, those three levels of photography where you have the design, the information and the emotion, which, you know, I, I, I took, um, I was helping with uh, Craig Sometko, so I got to want to give him props for that. But, you know, those were one of the things he, he, he pointed mm-hmm. out in one of the workshops he taught and that, so you have those three elements. I think a documentary project relies more on emotion and information, whereas a street photograph relies more on emotion and design. Yeah. yeah well, in, in speaking about that project on depression, I saw the one profile that you did on that one woman mm-hmm. that's on your site. Talk to me about how you gain access to her life. And specifically, you know, as you spent time with her, explain the sort of dynamic. Because you're whenever I've done do- documentary projects, it's sort of a balance between a certain level of engagement that you need to have with the subject. And the other part is, as you just said, thinking about the story and thinking about Mm -hmm. the context of the frame in terms of uh, the aesthetics, the storytelling, the information. So you sort of have to juggle several balls simultaneously. Right. So if you could discuss, discuss that specifically in relation to this particular woman that you profiled. Well, as far as access, I feel like um, that's where that earlier point I, I was speaking of where you have to decide what it is and why you're attracted to something and why you're doing something. And that that has to be something that you can't compromise. That has to be some, something that's based on something real. And the mm-hmm. access you get will connect with that. So personally, for me, you know, when I got out of the military, you know, I, I didn't serve in any like, you know, horrible wartime or anything like that. But I, you know, it was a transition when I came back to the civilian life, like it was different. And so there was a level of, I think, maybe some stuff that I had to deal with. And that's where photography came into my my life and being able to use it as a, almost like a therapy to go out into the street and to connect. So as far as that depression project, that came from something that I kind of felt and dealt with at some point in my life. Mm-hmm. And so I knew what people felt. I, I don't know how every person feels in different ways. Everybody has their own struggle, but I, I connected with that subject. And that made me want to kind of dive into it and kind of show like the different elements of it. And then I didn't know necessarily how to go about that. So I, I literally posted a Craigslist ad just talking about the fact that, you know, sometimes life gets difficult. And, you know, if you want to tell your story and it was more of like, you know, working on this project, Mm -hmm. um, you know, you you can feel free to reach out to me in this way. And I did get responses and I was really amazed by the responses I got. And I got quite a few. And at that point, that's when I had to, you know, obviously you want to, you want to take everyone's feelings to into account because when someone's reaching out to you, you want to be thoughtful of that and not just kind of blow that off. But Going through, you know, you pick the, the, the people or the projects or the subjects that you you, you want to tell. And for some reason, Nancy, who was the person that I focused on in that series, she just in her email, she kind of laid it all out right away. And it kind of made me feel like she not only, you know, could probably maybe benefit from working together on this, but also like that she was she was calling out, mm-hmm. you know. And so in that way the access kind of became a little bit more easy. And then from that point, 
you know, that's again, some uncomfortable stuff because now here I am from this project, this thought, now I'm in this woman's apartment who is, you know, close to getting evicted, who's having suicidal thoughts daily, who is looking at me with the camera and not necessarily, you know, at some points, cause she had a little bit of, I believe she was diagnosed with schizophrenia as well. So she, mm. she would, you know, kind of, as I'm photographing her at one point she was fine. And then the next point she's like, you know, ready to, you know, <laughs> you know, yeah. not know why I'm there. And, you know, so, um, but at the end, I feel like after the couple months of working together and, and then sharing the photos with her and then talking about it, she, she wanted that. She wanted to share that. And there's layers and there's levels of that, but she wanted to let that out. And I'm not saying that, you know, she, she still obviously probably, you know, has her things to deal with as we all do, but that was uh, something where the power of photography to show what it is that you are feeling like or looking like or dealing with and you see yourself, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, it really kind of came full circle in that one as well. So I think that's a place where access, being uncomfortable, um, you know, all mm -hmm. those different elements. But again, it ha it starts with, you know, the motivation, you know, my motivation wasn't to necessarily publish this story or put it into send it out to the whole world. It was more, you know, at the, I want to share it. Obviously, it's on my website. I'm sharing it. But it's more for like, at this moment, this is what I was thinking. This is what I was feeling. This is what I wanted to do. And this was the person that kind of, you know, wanted that as well. And so together, it's like a, we we did this little bit of dance for that, you know, couple months. And in and, and this time, you know, I was going to church with her and just different things. And through that, that's when those, that's when the images happen, you know, and I think you get to a, you get to that point where the images are ob obviously what you're there for, but they become like, um, like secondary in a way, like you start to do the work, which is connecting, which is everything that kind of, um, mm. you're, you're out there doing with the camera. But then the next thing that happens is now, you know, the image comes obviously, because that's part of it. Once you make that connection, once you, once someone's sharing their life with you, you know, the images will come from that, but you know, your motivation can't be like, I want to grab your image. I just want a nice photograph so I can, you know, <laughs> you know, yeah. and people, at least with those kind of projects or those kind of sensitive subjects, you know, people can see through that and they can feel that, you know, and they'll, they won't share with you if they feel like you're there to take from them, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. When you're working with someone like that, so intimately over a period of time, you more than likely go in with a general idea of what you think the story is going to be and maybe even what sort of pictures you make. But it's just the nature of the fact that you're collaborating with another human being, that things are going to change, that they're going to evolve. So how did the story and the pictures you made as a result start being shaped by you getting a deeper understanding of what she was going what she was going through because you mentioned you you were going through your own you know issues with depression so you had your own experience to basically spark basically spark the idea mm -hmm. but when you start witnessing someone else's experience and all of a sudden you start sort of bleeding your experience with hers mm -hmm. and that starts to change how you perceive it Yes, for sure. And photograph it. So talk to me a little bit about that evolution. Well, there's when you're photographing, especially trying to tell a story, there's a line that you have to always keep. And there's a, a level of even though you're connecting to, to really do it in, in a way where you're not now, you know, changing it. You, you have to still, you know, kind of respect the boundary of the photographer and the subject. Uh, mm -hmm. because once that line gets blurred too much, I'm not saying you can't tiptoe over it. Sometimes I do. And I have, but once, once you go too far now, it doesn't become a photo project anymore. It becomes something else. And, yeah. and that's, you know, something where, you know, to navigate that is, is, is the, is the, is the interesting part in that whole process. But as far as like how this, the, the project changes from conception I learned early on and photography has this power because I learned early on that you might have an idea, but you know, the real idea is already there and your, your idea is kind of like just turning the key to that car and then the car is going to kind of 
drive like it, the key doesn't necessarily make the car run in a way so mm-hmm. like your idea is like what's getting it ignited and you're starting and you have the energy and the motivation to do it but then as you go along you have to be open to like what that project's really showing you and what it is that you know is transpiring and if you try to like force it into the box it's not going to stay there because it does, it's not yours to push it in the box like it's you're an observer of someone else and so I think by by just in that project specifically like I had an idea of what depression looked like and what it felt like from my own experiences or and then you know and she wasn't the only subject I'm, I'm still working on this and I have several other subjects I'm working with but every one of them's different and you kind of have to you have to know um, what what the person is in front of you and and what what they're trying to you know say to you and what they're what they're sharing with you and and respect that and also let that live in its own light you know instead of I don't want to make someone look depressed when I'm shooting a depression subject or something I don't want to make someone look you know yeah. I don't want to find that necessarily that image might be helpful and I think in that series I have. Um, one or two that show the some sadness or some struggle, but there's also ones that show like the tension or the or the the holes in the shoes from not you know having the energy to go to the store to buy mm-hmm. shoes or Damn. just you know the the notes on the table that's all scattered from just having your mind just be kind of everywhere and and that's the stuff that I think kind of is the the layers that you know add to the whole story and um that's what i look for in a, in a project in a documentary project i i want to find the people and i want to find the scenes but i also want to dive into you know the details of of their lives and to try to yeah. tell it as true as possible so they don't necessarily because at the end of the day you know i one of my favorite um photographers is sebastian salgado obviously i think he's probably at one of everybody's favorites but what I love about his approach is he tries to, you know, make people look noble as possible or as subjects, or even if somebody's really in a mm-hmm. really tough spot to show the humanity of it all and to show the the way that people are struggling in life or feeling or dealing with different, you know, obviously global issues. And I feel like that part of it is the most important, that, that empathy, that connection to the other human being. And in that process, you don't have to try too hard except just being present and having some some thoughts and some and actually truly caring like when someone's talking to you about their life like to really like okay l- really listen you know like really try to really try to listen to that and then in that listening now you learn about them now you learn details about them now when you're in their apartment or you're you're with them somewhere you know what to look for because you've listened you know mm. you know there you know it's kind of it all works together it's not it's not like some kind of it's not a gimmick or anything like that. It's, it has to be real. You have to really care about what it is you're doing. And if you don't, you don't have to shoot anything. It's okay too. Like you don't have to do it, you know, but if you're going to do it, you, you need to care about it and you need to care about it to a point where people can, can relate to it. And, and that way you're helping the person you're photographing or you're helping yourself or someone else might see it that may be struggling with that. And they might, even if they get a little bit out of it, that's better than nothing. So, yeah. Yeah, so God is a great example of a man who, uh, a photographer, who really honors the people he photographs by displaying the inherent dignity that they have as human beings. And I sometimes see that lacking in other people's work because they're more intent on making a cool photograph or they have their own sort of agenda may not be the right word that I'm looking for, but you, you nevertheless see it in the photograph yeah. where people where you feel more pity right. than understanding. Right. You know right, what I mean? Right. Because when I look at Salgado's work, those are people on, who are living and working under the most inhumane conditions sometimes. But I never feel a lack of dignity looking at their photographs. Exactly. So aesthetic would be beautiful as the pictures are. His amazing talent in, is the fact that he doesn't uh, miss that in his, in his photographs. Right. And it, I think that's that's a really hard mark to sort of aspire to when doing um, doing that kind of work. Yeah. I, I mean, obviously, he's one of, you know, one of a kind and, and you don't necessarily have to to be anyone else or to 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 achieve the things that other people have achieved. You have to achieve mm-hmm. for yourself. And so you want to set your 
your standards, I think personally for me, I want to set my standards as high as possible because at the very least, if I'd miss the mark, at least I'm still shooting like high. And, and the, yeah. the, the point is like you, you're doing that. And, and when you look at the work and when you look at the, the, the kind of images that come out of um, so Mr. Salgado, it's basically like you feel the person, you feel what he's feeling, you know, and that's where I think the camera gets really interesting because now it becomes something that you're not just doing as a two dimensional print that you're putting on a wall or, you know, in that way, it's, it's, it's the actual process of, of taking that photograph where now you feel what um, Sebastian Salgado felt when you look at that image, you feel it, you can feel mm -hmm. what he was feeling, you know, you're not necessarily seeing what he's seeing as much as you're feeling what he's feeling. And I think yeah. that's kind of where, you know, when you can do that, when you can feel what your subject's feeling or trying to put yourself in their shoes, and that's where that empathy comes in. That's where, that's where the, the, the documentary images kind of are more interesting to me than, than street photography. I love street photography. I started as a street photographer. I always will shoot street photography. I do it, you know, just it's like I said, it's therapy for me to, to take my camera and go out in the street and find things and be surprised by what the world has to show me. You know, there's nothing like that. But then there's also the the level of, you know, spending time with a person or 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 a scene or, or some kind of um, subject that actually kind of matters to you and where you, you can spend time with it and photograph it and, and learn something about yourself and about the world and kind of connect it all. And it, it, it all is connected. It's not like you, you're a street photographer or you're a documentary photographer or you're a portrait photographer. Or, you know, I think there's all these these um these genres that they like to you know put people in but um i i don't necessarily abide to that i think like basically how i'm what my mindset is and what i'm feeling is what i'm going to photograph and that changes obviously as you change and that changes through you know your process and it, it to not allow yourself to change is kind of the same as not allowing your project to kind of tell you something that you thought it you know that you had in mind yeah. so you don't want to box yourself in so what, what's your professional life look like? I mean, we're talking about primarily about your photography, but you're also a designer. Yeah, so. well, I, I, um, I, I, I went to school for photography. I got my degree in photography from Columbia College here in Chicago, um, which is my hometown. And then uh, after I got out of school, I, you know, I basically, you know, worked as a portrait photographer for a little while. I started like a private studio. Um, but then once I got married, I was like, oh, you know, it's time to get a, a real job, get a, get go into the nine to five life and, and, and take care of things, you know, because the, the freelance life, as you know, sometimes there's, there's great months and there's months that are not so great. And, you know, mm -hmm. when you have, you know, more adult responsibilities, obviously you need things to kind of flow in a, in a, in a more steady, steady state. So I trained myself, um, as a designer, I learned, um, like InDesign and different programs and then. Uh, put myself out there and, and started working as a designer and, and then eventually as an art director. And I did that for about five years. And then that's when I, I kind of kept missing photography and going back to that. So my professional life now is, is mostly photography. I pretty much, you know, I shoot, I have clients here in my city of Chicago. I also do a lot of work with like Academy. Um, I teach workshops um, also with Momenta workshops. We're going to be doing one in Columbia in March of 2019. Okay. So that's going to be a lot of fun, but, uh, you know, we do pretty much, uh, I, I do a lot of different work within my community here. And then also, uh, around, you know, wherever I'm traveling. Um, so pretty much I, you know, that's, that's where I'm at now. So I'm just kind of working and pushing forward and, and, and going, going with it as it comes. And diversifying, man. That's yeah. That's the world of the modern photographer, man. You got to have your hands in a lot of different things. Well, I you know I keep I keep it to pretty much portraits and 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 documentary work, but you know within that there's a lot of there's a lot of room to kind of work with different people that are looking for the things that you provide um, from mm -hmm. from the same actual elements of you know what we just talked about as far as you know connecting with people and. And telling stories that, you know, a lot of the things that happen in, in today's world is storytelling, um, whether that's commercially or whether whatever that is, it's it's every every business has a story to tell. Every person has a story to tell. There, it's just it's an invaluable thing to be able to tell stories. 
Yeah. At one point, you were working really simply. I think it was with a Leica XL. Um, uh, yeah, X, X1. This was, a, yeah. I think a fixed lens camera. Yeah, this was, yeah. That's that's when I first, um, you know, went back into working as a photographer, working with nonprofits. Yeah, tell, tell me about, you know, choosing to work as simply as that. Because I recently have had an affinity for working with just, you know, one body with a fixed lens and, and, and nothing else. Mm -hmm. But why did you make that choice and how did it benefit you? Well, before I picked up that camera, I shot with a Leica M3 that was pretty much my only camera for the year with no meter or nothing like that. I wanted to get back to just seeing light and, and, and hitting and missing and, and actually figuring out scenes so I can get myself to a place where the, the light became something that you see when you walk in the room again, you know, cause once I took that break from photography, that kind of started to, you know, it's like anything you gotta, you gotta sharpen the sword. So getting that M3 was kind of like for that one year, I was just shooting, you know, for no reason at all, just for the enjoyment of it. And, hitting or missing through film and not knowing what the light was by just reading it, you know, not using any meters or anything like that. And that process kind of really, you know, prepared me to pick up pretty much any kind of camera. And the Leica X1 was um, something that I picked up. I think it might've been maybe six years ago now, but I picked that camera up um, because uh, first of all, um, it had a really good lens on it, um, a nice what kind of wide lens on it. And it was, connected and compact and it was something that you know at the price point i was looking at at that point it was something that was really you know a good a good buy for me and then i used that camera and i actually pushed that camera as far as you can possibly push that camera and <laughs> and that was like also what was interesting when you push that camera and you, you realize okay all right now it's time for the you know to the to get back to you know i went to another digital i went to a digital m from that point again now you, you you're starting to you know get in a creative state now from the m3 all the lessons from that camera combined with you know that digital x1 kind of came together and in, in the m8 and you know and i don't want to get too much into gear but it's important because it's it's what you know it's what necessarily it's your tool um to create so I think having a single lens, though, is something that is really important because once you change your lens again, obviously, it depends on what you're doing. But once you change your lens, you change your view, you know, like you literally change the way the world looks as you're shooting. And so when even a subtle change from, you know, 35 to 50 or 20, 28 to 35, these these little bit of changes really kind of shape you and the way your images are going to come out because it's it's your distance and it's your focal length to the world and to be able to to identify with one and to know what that is so when you have your camera when you're walking around you know what that picture looks like before you take it you know where the frame lines are in your head in a way like obviously you're not going to be perfect but you're there's a little bit of you know leeway there but you know as you're shooting like what it's going to look like when you start to switch lenses at least for me you know, when you start to get too much into, oh, I'm going to try this length or I'm doing this length because of this, you know, now you're not, yeah, you might get a great picture because you're shooting at 24 millimeters on a street and there's a lot of th stuff happening. You know, I'm not, I'm not knocking that style. I'm not saying that that's bad. I'm just saying it's, is it really what you're seeing though? Or is it just kind of like, because you're, you're at that, you know, that wide, you know, of a angle and you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. Yeah. Cause I, 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 I feel why, I, I, I recommend my students that they use fixed focal lengths, whether it's a 24 or 35 or 50 and use it for a period of time so that you can learn how to see from that perspective. And mm -hmm. that that ends up informing your choices in terms of how you want the photograph to look. Right. Yeah, exactly. And the experience that you want to have the viewer to have. I feel, I, th I think that when you have a Zoom, at least initially, I'm, I, I have a Zoom when I'm doing, you know, commercial work because of the convenience. But I think when you first get a Zoom, when you adjust the Zoom and you go, say, from 50 or 70 to 24, all you, the only choice you're really making is, I just want to have more in the frame. Right. Right. right Without right. really thinking about how including more elements in the frame affect the overall composition you're just thinking i want more or i want to be able to reach that one thing mm -hmm. and go to telephoto but you're not really thinking um in terms of composition you're not thinking in terms of story you know you're not thinking in terms of how 
different elements in the frame as a result of the lens choice right. play off of each other. Right, right. And I think that's why using a fixed focal length it trains you uh -huh. to see with that level of intentionality. Exactly, right. So you get to the place where you know what you're looking at as you're shooting it, and, and that fixed length is basically it becomes your eyesight. It becomes, you know, you have your eyes the way you see, and then you have your camera when you're shooting, And when you have that lens that's fixed and you have that same focal length that you go to all the time, you're getting that, you know, when you need to take a step forward, you know, when you need to move to the left a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. when there's something you don't want and you know how to get it out of the frame, you know, with the convenience of technology and everything, all the, the, the bells and whistles that many other cameras that people we all use now, you know, it's, it's really easy to get, you know, you know, to get complacent or to forget about those things, about the basics of photography. But, and you, again, if you're, if your goal is just getting a good image or something that you can, you know, you're happy that it looks fine and it looks good to you, then I guess that's okay. But it depends. Like, but if you're trying to really get intimate or get something that might dive a little deeper, you have to, you know, be at one with your gear to that place where it becomes almost out of the, it's not there anymore. It's just, it's just kind of the thing that you're using to do what mm -hmm. you're doing, but it's, it's, it's not in the way at all. Like, and that the focal length being exactly where you know it to be kind of really, really cements that because, you know, it's one less thing you're fiddling with. It's one less thing you're adjusting. It's one less thing you're playing with. And now you're just, again, that's what makes Leica cameras like, you know, great. And I'm not trying to sell Leica cameras right now, but what makes them awesome is the fact that they, they remove all of that, you know, some of the other stuff, it, it makes it, it's just one layer less. It's one, you know, one thing less that you have to deal with when you're looking through an M and you're looking through some at, at a subject, you're, they can see your eye. There's not this giant big block of a, you know, camera in front of them. And, and sometimes I think that that does make a difference because when I've shot with different types of cameras and even, you know, other Leicas that don't have that same, you know, kind of design as the M does, you know, it, it just kind of really, it changes, it changes the relationship and changes the, the, the way the subject might respond or, and that's where I kind of get into the thoughts of photography being this energy, you know, where, you know, obviously when you're taking someone's photograph, it's their energy interacting with your energy and the camera's kind of just capturing that. So mm -hmm. the less you can have to think about while you're doing that, like the, the better you're, you know, you're going to translate what it is you're feeling again to get back to that feeling point. Yeah. And so the fixed focal length, the knowing what your, you know, like knowing what your, your ISO settings are and what you're comfortable at and what you're trying to do before, like all that stuff, when you get it out of the way and now you're photographing and you're shooting, you're going to be able to get there quicker. You're going to be able to get to the place you want to be a lot, you know, with more ease and not so much, you know, confusion you know you don't yeah. you don't need to add more to yourself you know so obviously like you said commercially there's always a way where you need to have to adjust but i look sometimes at street photographs that have a zoom lens or they're from far away from a zoom and i can sometimes tell you know because it's not that the image isn't good it's just i don't feel the energy because you weren't there you weren't interacting with in that distance where mm -hmm. I don't see the exchange in the image, you know, when you're up close or when you're there and you're right there, you can feel it. You can actually feel it when you're looking at the image, you can feel how close that person was, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So tell me about Chicago as a photo town. What do you, what do you like about it? What's one of the more challenging things about, you know, living there and trying to work as a photographer? Chicago is a great photo town. I mean, it, there's so much here and, and, and I think it's, it's really kind of an underspoken town for, photography you know i mean especially when you compare it to like the new yorks and la's and you know even i'd say the miamis and boston's are having a little more um you know i'd say pull as far as photography towns but chicago really offers pretty much all of it that you know all those other cities offer but it also has these like unique neighborhoods and and there's still a lot of you know places where you can go to to photograph different communities and there's all these different festivals, you know, there's, you know, Pilsen, West town, you know, I lived in West town for like eight years, which is a, a neighborhood that's been changing, but there's just so many um, interesting places, Lake street, the West side of Chicago, the South side of Chicago, you know, if you're looking for subjects, if you're looking for, you know, 
interesting things or different, you know, Chicago, you know, is one of the places I think you can't beat it. Um, as far as like, as a photographer, obviously like, uh, you being in New York or being in LA is probably a little more helpful as far as when it comes to agencies or, you know, galleries and things like that. But I always looked at Chicago as like my hometown and, and my base. And so it's not that I, I don't leave home base and travel and go places and shoot others because mm -hmm. it doesn't offer enough here. But obviously in that way, you know, I think it's important to have that, you know, that town that's yours that you can own that is like, you know, that that thing that you always can shoot and, and know where you are. So, you know, I, I love New York. I love L.A. I love I love Miami. I love all those other cities. But Chicago is always going to be like, you know, my favorite city. So what, what's your vote for the best deep dish place in Chicago? Because I know there are two names that are often bandied about, but what, what's your personal choice? I mean, I, I like Lou Malnati's personally. That's that's like one of my, my favorite pieces. And, and, and I'm not really a deep dish fan, um, but there's a place called Peace Pizza in Chicago here in uh, Bucktown, and they have really great pizza. I think that's one of my favorite pizzas uh, in the city. Yeah, man. It's like when I go to New York or go to Chicago, it's just like, okay. What is your favorite? Well, I don't have one yet. I've went to one once. I went to Chicago once and they took me someplace and I can't remember. It was like one of the two places that's always talked about that you have to go to. Um, it was good. It was good. But yeah. I'm, I, I lean more to the New York style yeah. than, than crust personally. Yeah. But, you know, hey, man, I don't say no to pizza. Yeah, yeah. Who does, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, my last question that I ask each guest is uh, I ask them to recommend another photographer for our listeners to discover and explore. And it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who would that one photographer be and why? I think that people um, should probably check out um, a photographer. I'm sure people have heard of him. Donato Di Camillo. He's in New York. Yeah, Donato. Um, I love him. Yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a really cool guy. Great photographer. Um, he's, he's doing that kind of work that, you know, the stuff that, you know, some of the stuff I was speaking of earlier, trying to connect and be real, you know, that kind of stuff is what, you know, I'm interested in. And I think, you know, he's doing that as well in New York. Um, and so, you know, he's, he, he's someone I would definitely, um, look into. Um, and I want to just quickly, you know, give a, a shout out to like Tom Smith from Leica Academy. And, uh, and, you know, obviously, you know, the interview that you saw, um, about the LHSA, you know, he, Tom Smith has been an integral part of, um, my photography process and, and, you know, Momenta workshops and Jamie Rose and everybody that I'm sure, you know, um, mm -hmm. you know, th these are people that, you know, helped give me a voice to share my work, to get it out there, to, 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 to share it with other people, to speak with um, people like you. And so, you know, I think, you know, as long as we can keep pushing photography forward and, keep pushing the whole medium forward and, and, and people get more um, enlightened by doing this and shooting and getting into the process. And, and the best thing that happens is, you know, humanity gets a little better because now you're connecting with other people instead of just walking by them, you're talking to them, you're, you yeah. know, and in that little process, it's, it's a little bit of chipping away at some of the negativity that we all kind of face today. Absolutely. Amen to that. <laughs> Thank you, man. I really appreciate you sitting down with me, especially on your, on our 4th of July. Yeah. Holiday, happy so. 4th of July. Yeah. At least I was worried the fireworks are going to be going off because I'm living in the city over here, but they didn't start yet. So that's a good thing. Oh, that's good. Good. Glad we did it early. <laughs> all right. Awesome. Thanks to Nicholas Pinto for spending time with us. To find out more about Nicholas and his work, visit nicholaspinto.com. And you can show your support of The Candid Frame by writing a review in the iTunes store. You may have just happened upon the show, but many others use iTunes to search for photo podcasts. It's hard to stand out among the dozens of shows that are out there. Your reviews can make the difference between a listener finding us or not. If you believe in the uniqueness of the show and think it's worthy of attention, take the time to write a short review today. It will make a big difference. You can also support the show by making a monthly contribution through Patreon. And for as little as $2 a month, you can help us to not only meet the cost of production, but also allow us to improve our podcast, YouTube channel, and website. Or if you just want to make a one-time contribution, you can do so via PayPal. You'll find a link for both on the Candor Frame website or the show notes. 
thanks to Mickey Scardo for his recent donation to the show. Muchas gracias. To access our complete archive of interviews, download the free Candid Frame app, available for Apple iOS and Android. Not only will you immediately receive the latest episode on your phone or tablet, but you can now easily share your favorite episode on your social networks and help spread the word. And if you want to drop me a line with comments or suggestions for the show, you can email me directly from the app. Download it today by clicking on the link in the show notes or the website at thecandidframe.com. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at theothermartintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker, and our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at incompetech.com. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at simply at IbarianX. And this is IbarianX, and this is The Candid Frame.